This video is brought to you by DiceCAD. When it comes to TTRPGs, some games are designed with a very specific genre in mind, and the system feels built for that setting. D&D's mechanics are built around armor, magic, items, all that. Vampire the Masquerade is built around intrigue, hidden society, and drinking blood. Cyberpunk is built around T-posing nude through cars. But if you like to play in a variety of genres, that can mean you're going to be learning a lot of new systems, which can be overwhelming. So what about genreless systems, built so that you can utilize them in almost any setting, like the Cypher system? The problem is, Cypher doesn't feel very customized to a lot of settings, even with the few optional rules you can implement to help tailor it to your game. It also leans pretty heavily toward combat if you're running it for a game that might focus more on intrigue and mystery. Fate is genreless and has so few rules you can use extras to make it feel appropriate for the setting, but there is very little crunch and the system can be a little too loosey-goosey for some people. Now, I love Fate and Cypher, and even with what I'm about to talk about, I'll still probably run games in both of these systems. But I've learned about a new system, a genreless system that has a decently crunchy foundation and a ton of pre-built modular rules that are both well-defined and fluid enough to adjust to your style of play. I'm talking about what might be my new favorite system, Cortex Prime. Cortex Prime is almost more of a tool set than a defined system, almost, as its dozens of modular rules and traits allow you to pretty much build a Cortex Prime system for your specific game. Is your game focused on combat and magic? Easy! Is your game a murder mystery with literally no combat? No problem! Are you doing a high school prom one-shot focused on personal values and superpowers? Done! There's so many possible combinations and so much freedom within those combinations that I have yet to think up a TTRPG setting I couldn't run with it. And all of those possibilities make the book kind of hard to figure out. The book makes for a great piece of reference material, especially the online handbook, if you need to check on a rule. But if you're trying to learn the system just by reading through it, well... It took me reading the book, watching an actual play session, reading the book again while taking notes, and talking it through with friends before I got a firm grasp on it. I've talked to other people that were turned off enough by that that they kind of gave up on the system, which is a shame because, turns out, it's a great system. I think folks just need someone in the know to explain it to them, and thankfully, I think I know a guy. It, it, it's me. I'm the guy. Let's learn Cortex Prime! First, let's talk about how Cortex uses dice. Unlike literally every other system I've done a how to play on, you actually get to use your whole dice set. Almost. Look, I don't know how to say this, but, uh, D20? We won't be needing you. I'm sorry. But the rest of you, ideally, will need a good number of each of you, so dice collectors rejoice! In Cortex, when you're doing something with a chance of failure, you're typically going to roll a minimum of three dice, often more. We'll talk about where they come from in a bit. From those three or more dice, you will choose two dice as your total and one die as your effect die. The total is the number you will use to beat the difficulty of whatever is opposing your action, be it the role of an opponent or just the base difficulty of the action. So, higher numbers, better. The effect die is how effective your action was, but here's the fun part. It doesn't matter what you rolled on your effect die, only the size of the die matters. So, if you were choosing your effect die and you were choosing between a d6 that came up 6 and a d10 that came up 2, even though the d6 rolled a higher number, the d10 is the die you would want to choose because it is the bigger die and will result in a d10 effect versus a d6 effect. Now, here's how all this might play out. 
For simplicity's sake, let's say you're trying to tie someone up and you rolled two d10s and one d6. You came up with the d10s at 8 and 7, and the d6 came up at 3. Now, in this situation, let's say that your opponent's roll to resist is going to be 3d8s, and they have to choose two dice for a total and an effect die, same as you. You can absolutely take your 8 and 7 for the total, and since your opponent's highest possible total is 16, you'll almost certainly beat them. But your effect die will only be a d6, so they would be d6 tied up. Don't worry, I'll explain it in a moment. But you could take that d10 that came up as a 7 and choose that as your effect die. And if you win, they end up being d10 tied up. But that means they only have to beat a total of 11 instead of 15. So their chance of beating your total and avoiding being tied up altogether is a lot better. This method of dice rolling gives you options, and it also means that methods of adding more dice to the roll isn't just adding to a total, creating a system of growing unrealistic numbers, because you're still only ever choosing two dice for the total and one for the effect. In this choosing of totals and effects, the total half is pretty straightforward, get a number that beats a difficulty or opponent roll. But the effect die is a little less apparent, so let's talk about it. There's a reason that it is only the size of the die and not the number rolled that matters. In that last example, when we rolled to tie up our opponent, that d10 tied up thing is called a complication. Think of a complication as something that can represent damage, a negative status condition, or some mix of the two. You will describe the complication in a way that makes sense for the action being done. So if you were attacking with a sword, you might inflict a bleeding complication. If you were just trying to intimidate your opponent, it could be a frightened complication. But in this instance, we tied our opponent up and gave them the tied up complication. And that complication is a d10 because that was our effect die. What this means for the opponent is that anytime someone is rolling against them, that someone can add that d10 complication to their roll if it makes sense that the complication would benefit them. For instance, if this tied up person attempted to attack someone after getting that d10 tied up complication, the person being attacked by them could add that d10 to their defense roll, because being tied up would clearly hinder the attacker. If you lose a contest and already have the kind of complication you would suffer, that complication will step up by one die if the winner's effect die is equal or lower to the complication you already have. And if the effect die is higher than your complication, that becomes the new level of the complication. If you have a complication already at D12, since D20s are dead to us now, if that D12 complication is stepped up, the character is taken out for the scene, no longer allowed to act, representing that you're either physically overwhelmed, unconscious, or just mentally unable to continue. So if our opponent with the tied up complication was at a D12 and we attempted and succeeded to secure those bindings, that person would then be taken out as they would be so tied up they couldn't act anymore. Of course, effect die aren't just for making your opponent's lives harder. They can also be used to make your life easier by determining the size of an asset which is basically like a positive complication you make for yourself that only you get to use. Assets can vary a lot depending on what mod you're using, but it could be like crafting an item that you use on a future roll. The last few things we'll touch on with the basics of rolling are the real good rolls and the bad ones. If your total is five or more above the opposing total, that is a heroic success. This could just mean you succeeded with style, but it can also step up your effect die by one die size per five above. Or you might have special abilities called special effects that are activated by heroic successes. More on those later. On the opposite end, there are hitches. 
In a roll, any dice that come up as a 1 are called a hitch. The unfortunate thing about a hitch in a dice roll is that you cannot use those dice in your total or as an effect die. They are, for all intents and purposes, removed from your roll. Now, if this brings your roll below three dice, then your effect die defaults to a d4, so don't worry, you don't just lose that. If all your dice are a hitch, that is called a botch, and it means you just did the worst. However, what's worse is that the GM can choose to activate a hitch to give you a d6 complication befitting the action done. Or they can step up an existing complication you have by one die size if it makes sense in that context. You might still succeed at the roll, but if you had a hitch that is activated, you've succeeded at a cost. If your roll has two hitches, the GM can activate it to give you a D8 complication or even two D6 complications. Three hitches? You get the idea. Thankfully, to activate a hitch, the GM has to pay you, and the currency of the game is plot points. Players can spend plot points for a wide variety of effects. They're often used to activate special effects, but you can also use them to activate an opportunity, which is what they call it when a GM rolls a hitch, which allows you to step down one of your complications or step up an asset you've made. You can spend plot points to create temporary assets that you can use for a scene. You can double the number of dice you get from a trait. Covering those next, don't worry. Or include more results in your total. Or keep an extra effect die. If you're going to be taken out of a fight or contest, spend a plot point to stay in. They do a lot. Of course, the GM also has plot points they can spend to stay in the fight, activate abilities, and keep more results in a roll. But that's about all the GM gets to do with them. Okay, so we have an idea of how rolling and whatnot works in Cortex Prime, but where the heck do all these dice come from? Klaus, show me the character sheet! I can't! Didn't you listen before? Modular rules! There is no set character sheet! However, there is a sort of basic blueprint to follow. In Cortex Prime, when creating a character sheet for your game, you're going to choose sets of traits that fit your game. Typically, you should always have a minimum of three traits, and one of those trait sets will pretty much always be distinctions. A character has three distinctions, each of which is rated at a D8. These distinctions describe your character's role, personality, background, whatever makes sense. In a fantasy game, you might have distinctions like Silly, Cheesecake Elf, and Sorcerer of Flames. And in a murder mystery, you might have Duke of Worcestershire, No Patience, and Trained Duelist. There might be specific ones to choose from in a game, or they might be completely up to the players to come up with. But they should make your character unique. Sound familiar? Now, the other two trait sets you choose depend entirely on your game, and along with distinctions, these three trait sets are going to be referred to as your prime sets. Attributes and skills are the most common prime sets, but they certainly don't have to be. In a game all about societal intrigue, relationships and affiliations might be your prime sets. In your game, the prime set could be just about any trait set here, but whatever ones you choose must be essential to every dice pool you create in a game. This is why before I mentioned that your dice rolls typically always have at least three dice. You will always choose one die from each prime set. Three. So, if you're creating a fantasy game with plenty of combat, it might not make sense to have relationships be a prime set because you wouldn't always be rolling it. But it might make sense if your game is based on something like Steven Universe, where relationships are integral. The only trait that would almost never be a prime set is powers, as players will only ever have specific ones that are situational enough they could almost never come up every roll. 
each trait set serves a different purpose. Attributes and skills are the ones most TTRPG fans will be familiar with, attributes being an overall representation of characters' raw abilities, and skills being more defined areas of talent and training. And this works for a lot of traditional style games where you'll have a mix of combat, socializing, mystery solving, whatever. In games like D&D, these traits would get numbered modifiers that you would add to your role. In Cortex, traits are rated by size of die, so that when you use that specific trait within a set, you add that die to your dice pool. Sidebar, this also means that traits with smaller dice have bigger chances of rolling hitches, which I love. Because in a game like D&D, there really isn't any reason not to roll for the vast majority of skill checks, because even if you're unskilled, it isn't that big of a deal if you fail. In Cortex, if you have a skill at a D4, just rolling it willy-nilly has a 25% chance to net you a hitch, which isn't a drastic punishment, but it gives a little more weight to having higher skill in something. Sorry, that was a tangent. So we know we have three prime sets, one of which should be distinctions, and the other two should be essential to your game. But maybe you want more. Attributes and skills are perfect for your game, but does it also have powers? Or maybe values will be important enough to have around. Beyond the prime sets, you can add whatever trait sets make sense, allowing you to tailor make a character sheet that perfectly represents the setting you have in mind. What's more, these traits are not strictly defined. If you include attributes in your game, there isn't a set list of attributes. There are suggested lists, sure, but it's up to you. It could be the classic six from D&D, it could be just three to keep things simple, or maybe you have nine. Using skills? Well, if in the computer hacking Mega Man Battle.net campaign you're running, you know your players will never encounter physical challenges, probably doesn't make sense to have physical skills. Powers come closest to having a set list of traits, but even how they're utilized has options. If all this sounds like a lot of work for the GM and possibly players helping to come up with a setting, it can be. It might take a while to figure out exactly which traits you want in a set and which sets you want, and as we will cover here in a bit, which modular rules you want to further customize your system with. You might be thinking, well, if I have to come up with so much, why don't I just make up my own game? Because Cortex is giving you the framework. You might have to come up with your own specific traits, but it's telling you how to do so within each trait set and how to assign them value and utilize them. So, let's say you figured out your trait sets. Each set has guidelines for how to give traits values at character creation and That'll be half of character creation right there. Once you've figured out which traits you're using, that part of character creation is a piece of cake. Now we just have to add a few more unique things. First, a character will get five special effects. These are special ways your character can influence the game. By default, three of your special effects are hindered versions of your distinction, where you roll your distinction as a D4 instead of the standard D8, giving you a much greater chance of a hitch, but you gain one plot point for doing so. Since you always roll your distinction, being it is pretty much always a prime set, you can think of this as one of your character's distinctions that would be unhelpful and get in their way during a roll. This is just a clearly defined way for players to earn extra plot points by hindering themselves. So that leaves you with two more special effects to come up with. In a game, the GM might have developed specific special effects to choose from, but these can also just be left up to the players. The rule is the special effect should have a cost and a benefit. The benefit can be stuff like earning a power point, adding a d6 to a dice pool, stepping up a beneficial die for a scene, doubling the die included from a trait for a scene, introducing story details, stepping down non-beneficial die like complications, and so on. The cost could be spending a plot point, stepping down beneficial die for a scene, stepping up a complication, a triggered condition like getting a heroic success, and so on. For example, you might have one where when your roguish assassin gets a heroic success on an attack to an enemy, 
they create a D8 asset called Bloody Daggers for the rest of the scene. They could then add that D8 asset to dice pools involving further attacks or perhaps attempts to intimidate others. Another example would be a barbarian spending one plot point to step up their strength attribute die for the rest of a scene, whereas normally a player could only spend one plot point to step up that strength die for a single action. By default, a special effect is tied to a distinction, but in your game you can have them tied to other traits as well. For instance, if you have the powers trait set in your game, you will likely have your special effects tied to those, as they give your powers the extra oomph a superpower or magic should have. Okay, done with special effects. Now you have five points to spend on specialties and signature assets. Specialties by default are a narrow area of focus typically associated with a skill that grants you an extra d6 on a roll. So, if you have the sneak skill rated at a d10, and a specialty of blending in with the crowd at d6, if you were to try to go unnoticed in a packed mall, you get to add both your d10 for sneak and the d6 for your specialty. Signature assets are assets you always have, and one point starts them at a d6 rating, or you can spend two points to start them at a d8. They could be a specific weapon, a tie to an organization, a piece of gear. Like a specialty, if you can justify using that asset in a roll, it's a bonus die you get to add to your dice pool. Now, I mentioned weapons and gear as a signature asset, and some of you might be like, so my character only has a weapon or armor if I buy it as a signature asset? No. It's just that the weapons and armor they have are not iconic or narratively important to your character enough to have an impact on your roles. Here's what I mean. In a fantasy adventure game, it's safe to assume that probably every character has a weapon and some armor. You don't figure that into your roles. Only the traits you roll affect your dice pools. But let's say you're a paladin who has chosen to spend two points to have the signature asset D8, Sword of Holy Light. This isn't just any ordinary sword. This is your sword, the Sword of Friggin' Holy Light. And narratively, it matters. It is something special about your paladin. It gives the paladin an edge in combat or an air of authority. You could also have a thief character who has a signature asset, Thieves Guild, denoting them as a member of this organization which might assist them with getting information, having authority in certain criminal places, or knowing secrets in a city. If something is a signature asset, it is important to your character and matters enough to affect the narrative. After choosing those, aside from a name, description, and background, your character is complete. You're ready to play. And the main mechanics you'll need to know about to play are contests and conflict. Contests are roles between opponents who want different things. We kind of touched on it with that tied up thing. This could be you trying to persuade someone to do something or do a murder on them, though typically contests are not meant to cover all out combat. In a contest, the person initiating the contest rolls first stating their goal. After they have rolled, the opponent can choose to give in, just letting you win, or they can compose some dice and roll against you. If the opponent rolled a higher total, the ball is back in the initiator's court. You can choose to give in, which would give you one plot point and allow you to narrate the terms of your failure. Because if you choose to roll and you fail to beat your opponent's total, you'll be getting no plot points and they get to narrate the terms of your failure. Either way, these rolls can go back and forth until someone gives in or someone fails to beat the total of their opponent. Whomever loses, be it by giving in or failing their roll, will be getting a complication or even getting taken out for the scene. This depends on if it's a high stakes scene or not, which the GM should let you know ahead of time. High stakes scenes just mean that whatever is happening in the scene carries the risk that a PC can be taken out. Arguing with Lord Pennyworth over whether you're allowed to attend the fancy dress party is not high stakes, at least not in that way. 
getting into a fist fight with Lord Pennyworth as he attempts to lock you in the cellar is high stakes. Okay, back to contest results. If it is a high stakes competition, the winner and loser will compare effect dice once one of them has lost. If the winner's effect die is equal to or lower than the loser's effect die, the loser will take a complication equal to the winner's effect die. If the winner's effect die is higher, the loser is taken out unless they spend one plot point, in which case they will just take a complication equal to the winner's effect die. If the contest is not high stakes, it will always just be a complication and not getting taken out. Unless the complication they take steps up a d12 complication they already have, which would take them out. A third person can interfere in a contest if they don't like either side and want to put it to a stop. They'll have to pay one plot point to enter the contest, and they have to beat both of the other roles that have already been made. If the person interfering doesn't beat both of them, they get a complication from each of the other two for getting in the way. If they do beat the other two, the contest is stopped by the third person unless both other parties each pay that third person a plot point to continue the contest. Now, you can use a basic contest for combat, but you would probably only want to do this for one-on-one -on -one duels for obvious reasons. When it comes to combat between more people, you will want to use action order. In this, the GM decides who goes first based on what makes sense or who's initiating the conflict. Instead of a normal contest of escalating roles, now there will be actions and reactions. The person whose turn it is takes an action, such as attacking, and the person who is being attacked rolls a reaction to that, defending. Or the person taking an action might do something else with their turn, like trying to create an asset or something, and then they would just be rolling against a GM's difficulty dice. Either way, after their dice are rolled and their turn is over, that person gets to decide who acts next, be it another player or an NPC. It goes this way until everyone has had a turn. The last person gets to decide who acts at the beginning of the next round, and yes, it could literally be themselves. So not always a great idea for players to make the big baddie wait until last to act, because they might get to act twice. Also, yes, there is a modular rule to just roll initiative, so don't panic those of you who rely on structure. You're covered. Resolutions in combat actions are mostly the same as contests, just without the back and forth. Either the action succeeds or the reaction succeeds. If the reaction succeeds, the attacker doesn't get to roll again to try to beat it. The attack just failed. If the attacker has the higher total, you compare effect die. If the attacker's effect die is higher, they take the defender out of the scene unless the defender spends a plot point to stay in. Then if they do that, or if the effect die was lower, it's just complications as normal. Mostly. See, this can actually depend on the type of... Anyway, a major GMC will have the same character sheet as the players, so normal contest conflict rules of being taken out apply. A minor GMC will have a number of traits, at least three, at various rankings, but these traits can just be specific to them, they don't have to be the same as player traits. They're taken out and given complications like normal as well. An extra is a character so minor they just have a difficulty die that's just added to other GMC's roles instead of acting individually. So a big baddie might have a little minion extra who's rated as a D6, so when the baddie attacks with their extra helping, they just add D6 to their dice pool. Extras are basically characters who are assets. Now, here's where it gets interesting. A mob is like a minor GMC representing a group with a number of mob trait dice that represent the size of the mob and are all the same die type. All of these dice are included in a mob's dice pools. So if there's a big mob, that's a lot of dice. 
They also typically get some extra traits that represent different skills and abilities that mob has. When a mob loses a defense reaction, there is no instant taking out of it if your effect die is higher. Instead, if the effect die is lower than their mob trait die, they take a complication of that size. If the effect die is equal to or higher than the mob trait die, or a complication is stepped up to the size of a mob trait die, they will lose one of those mob trait die. You've taken out enough people in the mob to make it smaller. When a mob has lost all of their mob trait dice in this fashion, no more mob. A boss works pretty much exactly the same as a mob, but is a single powerful character and typically should have some special effects. Mobs and bosses are maybe my favorite way to run combat in Cortex because it's really easy to whip one up on the spot. If we're just using the most basic rules and traits, I've given you like 95% of what you need to know to play this game. The very core of Cortex really is just down to what we've covered. But if you're interested in Cortex Prime, it's because you want to be able to customize this system to suit your game's needs. And while choosing your trait sets is definitely a huge step in that direction, it isn't enough. That's where the mods come in. Thankfully, utilizing mods is just a matter of taking what I've already shown you and either replacing certain rules with alternate rules or adding new ones on top of these. I can't possibly cover every mod in Cortex Prime in this video. Well, I mean, maybe I could, but like that would that would just take way too long. And also, just go by the book, but let's talk about how they work. Complications. Those are neat, right? You get cut up by a sword, you got a D8 bleeding complication, and you've taken a D6 disoriented complication from a flashbang, and you're still working off a D10 humiliated complication from an earlier rap battle. Various attacks or effects could step up or step down these complications, all of which can be used against you. But like, now some guy is trying to hit you with a club, and you get hit and D... Do you step up the bleeding complication, or do you get a new D6 bruised complication? Oh, this is getting confusing. Well, thankfully, you can use the stress mod. Now, certain complications are all just grouped together. So, in a combat-heavy game, you might just have an injury stress track. So, be it a punch, a slash, or a firecracker to the butt, those complication die are always just applied to the injury stress track. Any other specialized complications can still be named individually, like a D8 poison complication that affects you differently than an injury. Hey everyone, this is four days into editing, don't have a script right now, Klaus. I just realized I never talked about recovering from complications, and I can't put it earlier in the video without spending an hour reorganizing the timeline. With complications, if it makes sense that a complication would go away after a scene, it just goes away. Like, if you had the pee your pants complication in a haunted house, and the next scene you change your pants, you don't got the pee your pants complication. Just use your common sense. If it's something that would require, like, recovery time and stuff, then in a resting scene where you're not doing actions, you can make a recovery action. The GM rolls 2d8 and you make a normal roll with traits that makes sense for recovering, and if you beat the total and your effect die is higher than the complication, you get rid of it. If you beat it and your effect die is equal or lower than the complication, just step the complication down one step. And if you fail the roll, then the complication either doesn't get better, or if you fail it with hitches and stuff, you might make the complication worse. Otherwise, if you're using the stress track, it steps down one die every scene. And then, with any complication or stress, if it's stepped down to a D4, you include that complication in your next roll, not your enemies. You get a plot point for doing that. Because there's a really high chance of rolling a hitch. If you roll a hitch, it steps back up to a d6. If you don't roll a hitch, you get rid of the complication. Okay, thank god. I'm, uh, this video is so long and confusing. I gotta just, uh, roll the tape. You could also just use a bunch of stress tracks at once. Running a horror-focused game, have a fear stress track. Have a track for anger, hunger, whatever you want. Just have physical and mental if you like fate, and never use complications. It's up to you. 
Now normally, stress die gets stepped down every time your characters go to a new scene. But let's say you want to have some more lasting complications. Then you could add on the trauma mod. Now if a character maxes out a stress track, taking them out for the scene, then the next scene they have a trauma. It doesn't just go away. It needs treatment or notably more time. Fill up the old trauma track and you're dead. No, no, you still don't like that. Where are the hit points? You want to hit people and see numbers go down. Keep a track of all these dice and... Oh, hey, look at that. Life point mods. There you go, number crunchers. What about for dice rolling? Okay, sure. How about a mod where you don't just choose two dice for your total, but instead add all the dice together? What about one where you re-roll for your effect die? What's that? You hate the whole effect die system? There's a mod for that. Hey, did you know normally when you're rolling for an action against a difficulty with no opposition, the DM still rolls dice for that difficulty? Yeah, difficulty is rated by dice size, and the GM rolls two dice of that size against your roll. Oh, what's that? Don't like that? You think difficulty shouldn't fluctuate because you as a GM want to choose what the difficulty is? Oh, hey, there's a static difficulty mod. Nice. But hey, wouldn't it be cool if there was a mod that represented increasing difficulty and danger, helping to pace out the session, adding to the tension, and oh hi, Doom Pool mods? <coughs> that are maybe a little too complicated. This video's so long. We gotta get moving. Oh boy, skills are neat, but you just hate how granular they are. Couldn't you just have some overall skill description categories that you use? Maybe call them roles? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, you said skills weren't granular enough, and in fact, instead of having skills and specialties, you just wanted specialties? Yeah, there are rules for that. Oh, no, no, maybe skills only go so high, then you need specialties to get higher to really help characters stand out. Sounds like a skill and specialty split mod to me! All of these mods and more allow you to customize Cortex to be the game you want. And I hope you can see how they can be used, sort of? The other way you can customize your game are the way that you can develop abilities by shaping the clay-like trait sets. For instance, are you running a game with magic? Okay, so like, how does magic work in Cortex Prime? It works however you design it to work. You could make magic be a skill specialty and have signature assets represent spells you're particularly good with. So when you cast a spell, you roll your prime set, the magic specialty, and if it's one of your signature spells, that die as well. In this regard, there isn't a hard rule for how often you can use magic, but when you roll hitches while casting spells, you might take complications that work against your spell casting. Heck, you might get those complications from other sources before you even get to cast a spell. Or you might use a stress mod you've decided to name Focus specifically for spellcasting. Want to limit spellcasting? Have it tied to a resource trait. A trait where when you roll dice from those traits, they're temporarily used up and you call the resource spell components or magic juice, I don't know. Want spells to be more defined? Make it so spells have to be special effects, or have spellcasting be represented by some version of the power trait set. You can have things like magic be as defined or fluid as you want in your game. Mods and the rules of each trait set allow you to take things like magic or tech or whatever and shape them into the system you want. It is a veritable bucket load of Lego bricks, ready to be shaped by your every whim but still structured enough that you know how it works and what your limitations are. And finally, we know how to build all this, but come on, how do you level up? Ba -ba -ba -ba, da -da 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 -da. Well, there aren't levels per se, but there are different ways for how your character grows. The simplest way is using game sessions as a currency. After every session, you get a point, and these points can allow you to create new signature assets, gain special effects, step up trait ranks, all that. You can also do a system with experience points that gets a little more granular, or you can do a growth pool, which would take a while to explain, but allows you to build up traits in a kind of natural way, I don't know. But typically, growing your character involves stepping up your traits to better die and buying new special effects, assets, powers, stuff like that. So, 
Yeah, in the end, I know this how to play video feels a little vague, but when you have a system that's designed to be as wildly versatile and modular as Cortex Prime, there really isn't a perfect way I've found to approach this. I think that's why I and a number of others struggled at first to learn it from the handbook, because how do you lay out a system with so many layouts? What's most important is understanding the foundation I hope I've established here. So long as you understand the ideas of trait sets, the role of prime sets, dice rolls, plot points, contests and complications, how all that works, you basically get the system. And I highly recommend for your first game trying out a more basic version of the game. Then build upon that once you're comfortable. I have plans to offer some free one-shot tutorial games on my Start Playing, link in the description below, so feel free to sign up and enjoy a short session with me game moderating you through some silly nonsense, maybe even with this weird attempt to directly drag over the traits from Dungeons & Dragons. It mostly works! I also hope to put up some little actual play content with Cortex Prime, but if you're impatient, go check out this awesome one with the creator of the game playing in the world of the Dragon Prince. If you buy the book, you actually, I think, get access to this and pre-built character sheets. Gives you a better idea of how everything works. Of course, if you're gonna play Cortex Prime, you're gonna need some dice, and where better to get them than from Dice Cat? Dice Cat is creating beautiful handmade dice. The pre-made sets are absolutely gorgeous, and you can even commission custom sets like I did with these awesome Fate dice. You can get the dice unfinished and paint them yourself, or have Dice Cat paint them with whatever color you choose. What's more, if you use the coupon code NOOBSGUIDE, you'll save 10%. Go check them out at DiceCat.com, or just click on the link in the description below. Dice Cat. Dice so nice, you'll never stop rolling them. Never! <laughs>